Welcome, everyone. I'm Amelie Schüde. I'm head of public practice at FOM. And first of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our speakers also for being here with us. Um, I'm kicking off with this event, a series of events um, titled On Assignment. And this is a programming that happens alongside the exhibition Open for Business, Magnum Photographers Working on Commission. Um, which is currently on view at FOAM. And we decided that we want to actually draw this out a bit broader and create a series of conversations and courses that would help photographers to get a bit more of an insight actually what this is, the media industry, and what it means to navigate it and somehow the space between own practice and this industry. Because for many photographers, this especially those that practice uh, within documentary, have a documentary practice, working in assignments or pursuing commissions can really be a way of building a sustainable career. And this is something that could, providing resources and knowledge around this is very important for FOAM. And therefore, we brought together a great panel of speakers. And um, I'm also going to hand over to the moderator for tonight which is Aaron Schumann. He is a photographer, a writer, and an educator. And yeah, he will be leading the conversation. And please feel free to put questions in the chat throughout the event. We will then uh, later have a Q&A round where we can pick them up and also throw them at the speakers. Aaron, take it away. Great, thanks so much, Amelie. And thanks everybody for um, joining us today. We have a really nice lineup of um, people. Um, like Amelie said, this talk is exploring how photographers engage with and interact the editorial and commissioning sphere um, from uh, all, all kinds of areas, but, but mostly centered around um, documentary in an expanded kind of sense. Um, and yeah, the, the speakers really represent kind of various institutions, organizations, publications that um, work with a lot of photographers, commission photographers, uh, collaborate with photographers in all kinds of ways. Um, so instead of me kind of introducing those people, what we thought we'd do, we're gonna try to keep this conversation reasonably informal because it's on Zoom and, and you know, it'd be nice to have a conversation rather than a, than a lecture. So um, what we thought would be nice is if the, um, the speakers could maybe introduce themselves a little bit and talk about, um, primarily what their what their position is within um, their organization and within the, the media industry at large and what their in, in a specific sense what their roles and responsibilities are within the context of their um, uh, their role their job so um, so we have four speakers we have four um, speakers today um, we've got Emma Bokit who's the director of photography at the Financial Times weekend magazine. Uh, we have Alex Maioli, uh, a photographer and member of Magnum Photos since 2001, and also a founding member of the Chisura Photo Collective, which um, launched in 2008. Uh, then we have Laura Summerton, uh, the photography manager at WaterAid, and um, David Bareda, who is a senior photo editor at National Geographic, and also a core team member of Diversify Photo, which is a community of photographers, editors, and producers who are working to diversify visual st storytelling within um, the mass media. So, so yeah, so um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Emma and ask her if she could maybe introduce herself and talk a little bit about what she does. Hi, uh, thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be with you and I look forward to having um, a chat with you all later, so please, if you think of questions during the time that we're talking then just throw them into the chat and then we can um, make sure that we have enough time to talk to everyone about them. Um, so I'm director of photography for the FT Weekend magazine which is a news and current affairs weekly um, housed in it's a weekend section that's housed in the F Financial Times. Um, I'm responsible for commissioning and producing photo assignments and um, as Aaron said, I'm going to kind of detail a little bit about how that works, just, just very briefly. Um, it will often involve a story outline coming from a writer that will be commissioned by the magazine editor. Um, as a team, uh, we will get together and we will discuss the visual approach and potential photographers that we would like to collaborate with. We work closely with photographers on assignment where possible and rather than 
working through agents, we kind of have an intimate experience that allows trust to build. Um, some assignments are more complicated and they would need a more hands-on approach where possible. Um, we kind of try and sort of um, be as free with the briefing as we can so that the photographer is really sort of feels like they take ownership of the of the story. Um, I would look at personal work as an indicator of an artist's interests and passions. Um, what's interesting for me is is seeing what kind of themes that they're exploring and how they are how they are communicating through their visual language. Um, we are a very small photo team at the magazine, uh, just myself and Josh Lustig, and we occasionally will have a freelancer working with us. Um, the, do the job is very deadline driven, but we'll be working on stories with shorter deadlines and longer deadlines, and we'll be kind of juggling those stories uh, on a daily basis. I'm researching, actually I'm researching a project now which is potentially going to be a year in making if it kind of if it if it works out so you know it can be something that's triggered by a news event that happens like almost immediately you know we'll need to kind of turn it around sort of in two or three days or we could be working on something much longer and, and we work kind of in in both ends of that scale um much of my job is uh Involve, involves building relationships with photographers, editors, galleries, um, agents, and expanding my network through meetings and folio reviews, workshops, and conferences, both in person and online. We will connect with photographers on social media and through personal um, introductions, word of mouth. The magazine works with early stage practitioners alongside established artists. Um, I'm responsible for budgets and um, negotiating fees. Josh and I um, actively research and produce photography-led stories uh, for the magazine. These can sometimes be news-led and timely or long-term personal projects. So that sort of sits alongside the commissioning assignment work that I'm, that I'm doing for the mag. Um, we produce three sp photo specials per year and they are often themed. And in order to do this, we will reach out to our networks internationally so that we present um, work that is, um, is showing and uh, presenting a unique perspective and a um, global vision. Artists are encouraged to include their own texts and their own, so their own words. So in those, specifically in those, but more broadly in the magazine, we will often invite um, photographers and artists to work and to produce texts, you know, or, or, or be interviewed so that their voice comes through in the magazine. My background is in photography. I studied at um, Goldsmiths and this very much informs the way that I work. Thanks very much. Great, thanks Emma, that's, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have a million questions but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hold off um, and let the others introduce themselves. So. Um, so yeah, next I'd like to ask um, Alex if he might introduce himself um, and maybe again, you know, talk a little bit about your your roles and what you feel like your responsibilities are, um, both as a as a photographer, but also particularly in terms of your relationship with the uh, collectives and organizations that you are a part of, um, namely Magnum and Shizura. Hi, good good evening. Um... Uh, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So. Yeah. Okay, nothing. I'm Alex Maioli. I'm a photographer. I was born in Italy. And uh, I'm here in this talk uh, because uh, I think because I am a photographer of Magnum Photos. And, um, and I was also the president for Magnum Photos, which is, goes to the point uh, of also to be responsible for the organization you're part of. And then uh, in 2000, uh, 2002, uh, I was living in New York, but um, I had the necessity to build my own studio to produce my, uh, my work, et cetera. And then uh, I, did, I decided to have this studio in a remote area in the Northern Italy. And uh, I bought a little house with my ex-wife uh, in, in a village called Cesura. 
and um, and became my studio. And uh, over the years, many assistants, maybe young uh, photographer came work with me in these places. In 2007, with uh, five of them, we decided to form uh, um, a collective. I told them uh, instead of be show your portfolio, be on your own, etc. Uh, why we don't keep working as a as, keep experimenting. Uh, in this remote village and um, and became a, this collective called Cesura from the village of name, but Cesura also in Italian means uh, cut off um, from something. And then uh, I think as we really represent what we wanted to do with that collective, which is uh, 15 years is really active now. We are also a published company, which is published only the book of the member mostly, uh, only. Uh, and we try to survive on the market, we invent every day, or we copy every day um, uh, other, other model, um, models of economy, sustainable uh, possibility in photography. And um, at the same time, uh, I'm part of Magnum, so we have this, I have this kind of the big uh, tradition. Actually, this year we are, we're gonna celebrate 75 years anniversary. And the other is like a small, um, a small, small group of young photographer that uh, are surviving in that. What I would say. Right. And that's it. And then I'll wait for the question because uh, I don't know where to go from here. Yeah, there's a lot of directions we can go in. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's really really helpful. Um, and and yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And next, I'd like to ask Laura Summerton, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your role at WaterAid and, and how you work with photography and photographers. Um, yes, as Aaron said, I'm the photography manager at the NGO uh, WaterAid. And before I come on to sharing uh, about my role when it comes to commissioning, I just thought I would briefly describe what WaterAid do for those of you who aren't familiar. So we're an international charity which focuses on the core issues of water sanitation and hygiene. We work in 28 countries around the world, but we also have a presence on the global stage advocating for um, universal access to water, a decent and safe toilet and good hygiene. You might have a vision of water aid installing, installing pumps and taps, and whilst we do still do that, we only do it um, in the context of ensuring a sustainable system which can be maintained by local stakeholders and all of that on the ground work goes hand in hand with our advocacy at local national and international level access to water and sanitation are human rights they should be demanded by communities and implemented by governments and we act to facilitate that process so uh, in terms of my work uh, so the photo team at water trade is three people uh, we spend a third to about a half of our time commissioning photographers and organizing shoots so a considerable amount of time and I'll just quite try and give a quick sense of how that breaks down. So we do maybe two, one or two large fundraising shoots a year. So that would be um, going overseas with a photographer, with a filmmaker, uh, spending about two weeks in a community documenting um, life sort of in a community that doesn't have access to water and sanitation. In addition to that, there might be one or two ad hoc overseas shoots. This might be just a response to um, a need, uh, sort of a need for a media pitch or a particular issue or an exhibition. And then all other shoots, which I think roughly works out as around one a month, uh, we wouldn't travel for. We would commission a local photographer, and I guess by local I mean someone from that country or from that region, uh, and we work in partnership with our colleagues. We have colleagues in every country in which we work, uh, so they would help us with the logistics and some of the, uh, the interviewing. Pre-COVID, we traveled a bit more. Uh, during COVID, we found ways to commission without any travel. Um, so my responsibility when it comes to commissioning, I think is split between representing the photographer and the needs of the organization or the team that I'm working with to produce a particular project. Different projects allow for different degrees of creative freedom. A fundraising shoot needs obviously to raise money, so perhaps allows for the least deviation away from what you might consider traditional uh, NGO imagery. Though even in that space, we want to test, we want to try new things, and we certainly don't want to produce imagery which perpetuates stereotypes. A commission for the media uh, might give us a bit more creative freedom. For example, we've commissioned uh, Mario Masalau, Etinos Ravon, Holomi Basu, and um, in partnership with the British Journal of Photography, we recently commissioned Ngadi Smart and Kelvin Chow. 
um, and we will soon be releasing a wonderful series of diptychs, um, uh, also part of that commission from Columbia. Uh, and a commission which allows for the greatest creative freedom uh, would po probably be, be for an exhibition. Um, we recently, oh, about five years ago, we commissioned Ida Malena, uh, which resulted in a show at Somerset House as part of 154. Um, and we have an upcoming exhibition with Laura Elton Tawi, which we've just shot in Malawi, and which I would love to talk more about if we have the time. Um, so my last two points, uh, I think at Wardrobe we have a record of working uh, in creative partnership with some really incredible photographers. When we commission, we want to work with the grain of the artist's professional development and not against it. Uh, the interesting challenge uh, for me is to consider a photographer's practice, combine it with a central aspect of, of Wardrobe's work, water, sanitation, human rights, gender, health, and then find the right home or out put for it, be it an exhibition, a pitch or online content. Um, so bringing those three things together, that's the really my job. Um, and last of all, before I wrap up, I just want to mention that this way of working with photographers, this questioning of what NGO imagery could or should be, and really stretching that, uh, is an approach, and it's an approach that I think we, Watertrade is one of the leaders in the sector in terms of what we do there. It was established by uh, my predecessor, Neil Wissink, who is now the creative content lead. But about five years ago, when he was the photography manager, he commissioned um, Ida Maluna, who for those of you who don't know, is an Afrofuturist artist. And she produced a series uh, for us using models rather than people in the community. And it was a watershed moment. Um, the organization went from saying like, Afro, Afro what? to you know, our supporter care unit, taking calls from supporters and having conversations about Afrofuturist art. Um, and that series has gone on to be exhibited around the world. It's taken on a life of its own, spreading our mission to um, new audiences. And I think it's just such a clear demonstration of what can be achieved when a good commission falls into place. Great, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, great, perfect. Um, good. So. Um, Last but not least, I want to invite David, if he could talk a little bit about his role at National Geographic, as well as maybe talking a little bit about um, uh, Diversify Photo as well, which is uh, a kind of core part of. So that would be that would be really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I am a photo editor, senior photo editor on the history and culture desk here at National Geographic. Um, we cover a lot of stories that are current day, but also uh, archaeological nature, um, centuries old, and, uh, you know, being at a place like National Geographic, just trying to bring a lot of those stories um, to life and make them be as visual as possible. Um, so I'm always thinking about that. And it might be uh, in the pages of the magazine, but I'm as passionate about um, the way information is presented on Instagram or TikTok. Um, I really do think we, as a, um, as an outlet, uh, need to meet audiences wherever they are. So when I'm working with photographers, a lot of times, you know, we, while everybody thinks they know what happens at National Geographic because they're maybe so familiar with the, the channel or with the magazine, um, on the inside, it's very different. And, uh, you know, so I think a lot of times it's just sort of working with that photographer to say, you know, how would you tell the same story, but uh, over time or, in almost no time at all, 30 seconds. Um, what what can you tell? And uh, you know, we we're uh, we're known for you know some more longer term assignments. Um, you know, we might have a a story that stretches out days, but more likely months and even years. Um, I like to bring up the example that we don't follow three cheetahs at three periods of their lives. We actually follow one cheetah through three periods of its life, um, something along those lines. And, uh, you know, I, it's great fortune to be able to, to um, think about stories and approaches to topics and things of interest around the world, but also uh, with depth that, um, you know, can be referred to later um, and uh, be of interest uh, on these different platforms. Um, as a photo editor here, I think uh, a thing to note is I really think a lot about how to work collaboratively, both with the photographer, their assistants, any uh, local support we might need, any um, access we might need to, to get, and uh, but also with 
text colleagues, with maps, with graphics, um, with people who control, you know, who are helping get this information, these, you know, videos or photos out on the different platforms. Um, it's the largest visual newsroom I've ever worked in. Um, I've worked in very small ones where I was the lone representative to ones where, you know, I was one of two, um, which was a big step up. Um, but, you know, uh, so I think it, it's, it's great, but uh, the essentials don't change much. It's, um, it's watching photographers, getting to know their work, uh, trying to, um, to line up, you know, those passions that they have with the stories that are right for us. Um, and it's trying to get those passions into a viable pitch that I can then pitch to my desk because um, from the inside, it's not just me saying yes and giving support to story. It's a whole bunch of folks uh, all the way up the chain to, um, to my editor, my editor's editor, their editor, um, when we really do get behind something uh, and the magic happens. So, um, you know, I think that is a big part of my role. Um, I do want to take it just a, a minute to talk about, or a couple minutes to talk about Diversified Photo because it's the other passion I have. Um, it's something, it's an organization started by uh, Brent Lewis and Andrew Wise back in, I think, 2016, somewhere around there. I remember sort of joining and thinking, um, hey, this is something I, I believe in. Uh, photographers of color um, based all over. And we would just create a very simple thing, a database um, for editors to go to if they're signing and get to know um, these photographers. Well, it's grown a lot since then. It's over 1,200 members around the world. Uh, sorry, 12, yeah, 1,200 members around the world, uh, hundreds of uh, up next photographers who are sort of the emerging photographers. Um, and we're in really good company um, with, you know, uh, partners like, um, uh, sorry, with folks that are um, with Authority Collective, Women Photograph, uh, Native Agency, Everyday Projects, Indigenous Photograph, and more, places where photo editors can find and work with photographers, keep an eye, reach out to them. Um, and so that's sort of the outside facing part of it. Um, and then internally, you know, with uh, newsletters and other things um, with, uh, with our membership, we can just help give support to photographers and, and give them some help with some skills, um, be a point person. You know, I, I try to have a very open door, open inbox uh, as um, with photographers. Uh, you know, I started out in this, um, in this industry as a newspaper photographer and I, would walk into a, a photo department of 20, 30 photographers that were all on staff. And that is so rare these days. Not only having that staff, but actually going someplace where you can find that many other photographers because we're all independent. We're all working from kitchen tables or coffee shops or what have you. Um, and so, you know, who can you ask and who can you turn to? Uh, you know, I hope we get into a little bit about um, I mean, we will for sure get into a little bit about gatekeeping and things like that, but uh, you know, the, this photo community is small. I, I think of it, I approach it as family um, because you never know when you'll next cross paths with someone and what great project and conversation you had will, will turn into a project and um, what's the right place to pitch it and, and things like that. Um, I think I'll stop there because I think having the conversation will be much more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. No, I really appreciate that. And it's really, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think, obviously, it would be really nice to get into um, some of the more kind of conceptual and systemic issues that are that we have to kind of discuss. Um, but um, I'm assuming that a lot of people in the audience are photographers themselves who are interested or already engaging in um, the kind of media landscape. Um, and so I thought it would be really helpful to start just on a practical level to ask a few questions, just how the system works, because I think there's a lot of assumptions that are made about how these things work. I think also 
things have changed dramatically over the last two or three years um, with everything that's that's kind of gone on and happened um, in that period of time. So I think it's it's important to kind of maybe uh, confirm, but also uh, break some of those uh, assumptions that we might have about about how commissions happen, how um, organizations and publications and collectives kind of engage and work with their photographers. Um, so I've got, um, uh, like I said, I have a, a long list of questions. I don't think we're gonna get through them, but this is a bit of a triple triple header, um, but I might throw it towards Emma to start. Um, so, <laughs> so she perks up her ears. Um, <laughs> so, <Mind and> notes. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, I guess the question, like I said, it's a triple header here, but first of all, how does a photographer come to your attention or get your attention these days? Um, also, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the days of kind of, you know, running around cities, dropping portfolios off at desks, but I know it's changed a lot since, since those days. So how, how do, how do, how do you, how do they kind of get on your radar? Um, and also, um, if they do, do you, do they already have to have some sort of experience or quote unquote traction in the editorial and commercial field? Or are you open to working with fresh talent and even working with people who are coming from maybe an arts-based practice, but haven't necessarily engaged with commission and editorial work. Um, and lastly, if you are willing to engage with people who, who don't normally or, or haven't had the experience yet of working within um, commission work, um, what kind of skills do you think are needed um, on a commission level that don't, that, that, nest, that that they that somebody who's working on a personal creative or artistic practice might not necessarily have yet or have developed quite yet okay sorry um, thank you <laughs> yeah thank you for that um so firstly to just say david um for everyone um it was so nice to hear you speak about your practice and i feel that there are so many um mirroring points and in, in, in the ways that we work certainly um david and i um you know, coming from a similar perspective to some point, you know, I really loved hearing you talk about your open inbox, open door. Um, and that's, um, that's sort of how I see it. So when you ask how, how, how photographers get onto my radar, I think I'm looking in, I think I'm sort of looking quite across the, across the platforms to kind of you know for photographers coming to me and for me coming to photographers I suppose in the in the olden days you would like you say sort of be dragging your portfolio and it would be print portfolio and you go and sit you know you try and make an appointment to see a an, an editor and I mean those things don't happen it's so much anymore I mean they still welcome I, I love meeting people in person but I mean it, it you know I work on a global newspaper and I live in London and there's only so much traveling. And of course, in the last two years, there's been um, no traveling at all. So you, you, you know, a lot of the meetings that I'll have are online. Um, but in terms of people um, contacting me, artists contacting me with their portfolios, it can, it, you know, it'll often happen from a, from a, um, an email that they'll send with a with a an introduction and then you know sort of link to their website or if it's for a specific project they'll put you know they'll sort of have a pitch to a prop for the project and this and a kind of portfolio of pictures or um or it'll be kind of will you know meet at events or something you know portfolio reviews or all of these different things that we're doing in, in the in the community sort of in the broader community so it's I, I kind of feel like it's probably easier these days to get on on an editor's radar than it was it, where you were kind of specific to your location and taking your book physically around and you know, I'd like to think that with social media, you know, and and, and the networks becoming broader, um, you know, and all of these other platforms, you're we're able to kind of reach out. And it's a it's a kind of two way traffic. You can come to me or and I can come to you. I often will reach out to photographers that I see online or, you know, I will I'll know that they've worked with a different organization and I'll ask for an introduction. So it's sort of it, you know, we're both actively. Um, we're both you know then both sides are active you know then the artists are active and the and the editors are active also um 
do they need to have experience? No, not at all. Not not for our publication anyway. I mean, I the magazine has always worked since I've I've worked on the magazine for twelve years, and since I've worked with the magazine, um, I've always sort of strive to work with um, graduated, gra you know, photographers who are graduating and early career artists alongside established ones. So to, we have that balance in that we've always had that balance in the magazine. And, you know, it's, it's, it's more, it's being aware of, of, you know, that level of experience and having transparency and building up trust and relationship with that, with that artist. So, you know, I'll know that if I'm working with a with an artist who is less experienced, I need to kind of take it a little slower. And, you know, we build up, you know, the conversation, how to, you know, to practical things like what we expect when you're delivering files, you know, what, you know, we have information sheets that we, you know, and we talk through how the how the work is, is, um, you know, not just in its in the pitch stage but also in the deliverable stage so it's just it's a slower way of working sometimes often and but it, it's really fulfilling to be able to kind of work with artists I know you know I've worked with artists now who I've met at their degree shows which in London it's happening now the degree shows are coming and I'm going on Friday to see the first round um, and then be working with them sort of five, six, seven years down the line, Kian Obersmith, who I met at his degree show, I'm still working with now, sort of, I don't know how many years on, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, so that relationship has become, you know, very deep and, and, and personal. And I love that David said about it being a family. Um, I completely agree. I, I think it's, you know, it's sort of, it, it's such a generous space i think um i can i can take i can take i can take the last question off your shoulders if you'd like okay, great. maybe i'll maybe Sorry. i'll pass, maybe i'll pass the last question <laughs> over no 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 just to let other people you know um, yeah. uh, have a chance um, um so maybe maybe laura and or david if do you have any kind of response to that question of um are there particular skills that are needed on a commission that that um you know somebody who might be coming from a personal practice an artistic practice a self published kind of you know self-initiated practice um needs to kind of develop in order to work on commission with you yeah i think it would completely sorry david <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it would completely depend on the nature of that commission for us you know if we're not with the photographer and we're relying on them being entirely in the field um perhaps with colleagues we we really need someone who's mid career level and has generally already kind of proven that, that they will be able to execute those things they don't they uh i you know i wouldn't be so worried about them uh if they were an established practitioner you know uh, potentially sort of moving in a new direction or or trying new things but it's but i i would look to ensure that there was a kind of a track record of of delivering because they're so kind of um high high sort of high risk these shoots in a way you know we put so much into them and then it's one week and then um everything relies you know on what we what we get back um if i'm if i know that either myself or some colleagues are going with the photographer then i think there is more um there's definitely a lot more potential there to go with somebody slightly earlier in their career and you know we, and we we have done particular you know, uh, a photographer's first NGO shoot, um, and that can it can mean like learning to shoot in a in a particular way. Um, there are various shots that we sort of you know we we would expect. Um, so yeah, I think it would depend on that commission and whether you know who's there supporting them. Great, David. Do you have any response to that in terms of the types of you know what you're expecting from a photographer coming to you and and how relevant their artistic or personal practices to, to the way that they're working with you. Yeah, um, thanks. I, I think I'd, what I'd add to what's been said is that, um, you know, at a place that does documentary style photography the way we do, um, then we, we do have a lot of expectations. So, uh, you know, if I get a pitch, I try and evaluate it both on, is this right for us? Um, is it, you know, are we interested? And then, you know, 
I do want to look at the photographer's work and see, you know, show me examples, not of this story maybe, but just that you've worked in this way, that you've told visual stories. Um, we don't publish a lot of portraits, um, mm. you know, and it's very, uh, you know, documentary approach and, and editorial. So um, I just, I do want to see some examples of that. And, you know, when I, when I say family, I mean, we're, we're all, you know, a lot of photographers are, are independent. And so, you know, they need to, um, they, they have their, their own concerns. I'm not saying do things uh, just on trust, but I am saying like, we're, we're all connected here. I mean, even some of these names on the Zoom are very familiar to me. Um, you know, this first pitch might not be right, it, you know, but it's something to develop, uh, you know, just try and keep things cordial, um, you know, uh, we're all here to try and lift photography and make it be as good as it can be. Um, you know, a, saying no to a, a pitch doesn't, isn't a personal thing. It's, um, or, you know, some kind of project. Um, it's more just, you know, there's a, a multitude of factors. So, you know, I try, even if there's a pitch that comes in, that's not right for me, you know, just what can I do as an editor just to help strengthen it for, someone else um, mm. or another location. But, you know, um, I think we're also all just watching who's publishing whom. And, you know, if I see somebody doing great work and I feel like that's uh, a good place, um, you know, in an area that, that I'm interested in, you know, reach out to that photographer or, you know, it's, it's also can be a two-way street, you mm. know, hey, this is great. Would you be interested in doing something along these lines? Um, you know, I have a story because sometimes, yeah, we do put, it's not just pitches from photographers. Sometimes we do have a text story and we need to assign, but, um, you know, I just say, I get a lot of emails that are like, hi, this is, this is my Instagram feed, um, which, you know, for a place like us doesn't work. We, I need to be able to see that the photographer can think documentary and can think in a story level. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I find that kind of interesting. So, you know, try a lot of times it's, you know, photographers that aren't in the Amsterdam, you know, media sphere or the London or the, the you know, New York sphere. And so, you know, I think we have to do things like this to, to get, to ha have people understand a little bit of, you know, what things look like from where we're sitting. Um, yeah. But yeah, just think about, when reaching out, like this is relationship building um, because it's something that can happen. Like it may not work now, six months from now, a different pitch, a different story project. Um, maybe going out to Laura and saying, oh, you know, her organization's really interested. And then, you know, starting to develop that work and say, okay, now there's a really interesting water story pitch that's more like a, National Geographic pitch or vice versa with, you know, there's a way to sort of um, be thinking along those lines because we can't support every project, but sometimes, you know, very talented photographer um, gets like a, some kind of funding from a, a nonprofit or something um, might make something more possible for us to, to publish. So there's that too. Great. Thanks, Alex. I just I just wanted to turn to you a little bit and get a sense of because um, obviously you know you've you've you developed a career where you kind of established yourself at quite a high you know at an ex extremely high level, um, and in the past you know and and to a certain extent in the present a lot of people still you know aspire to and have ambitions of joining some an organization like Magnum. Uh, in a sense, it used to be seen as a golden ticket, like you were going to be commissioned 30, 365 days a year um, once you got that job. And I know that that's not the reality. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in this kind of turn that you made towards the, the kind of local rather than the global, um, you know, after having already established yourself at, at, that, at that kind of pinnacle. Um, and, and, you know, what kind of things do you encourage the photographers you work with, the younger ones or at Chisura, in order to, to kind of... Um, find their way and navigate their way towards um, getting getting commissions and working within the media at large? Uh, yeah, it's interesting but because uh, 
there are similarity, but also really uh, two different paths to take. Funny enough, uh, we are. I'm here in New York. Uh, tomorrow start the annual meeting. So what does it mean? Tomorrow is the first day we're gonna. Uh, the photographers submit their portfolio. In the past, they become you know there's different steps: uh, nominee, associate, and a, no, a member. And tomorrow is the day we, we decide who will be the new nominee. Who's gonna be the 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 photographer gonna take care of the agency in the future? Um, but this is a really about the answer to your question. What we're looking uh, at the at this body work is has to be a loud voice um, that doesn't have to be established, doesn't have to be a particular town or country. The, the most uh, var variety we have, we are really really appreciated, uh, but have to be loud and personal have to be uh the, we have to see tr mm, commitment but commitment in a way like uh, purity mm. um and that with the, with the way it's been always choose photography magnum in the in the history i mean uh, I mean, I'm surrounded by, you know, Bruce Davidson, Kudelka, Alex <laughs> Salt, uh, uh, I don't know, I can turn around, uh, we have uh, Karl Kaiser, any sort of uh, history is like, uh, in Cesura recently, uh, we decided to not apply, did, did not, did, to not open the door to any new photography, for example, photographers, uh, and the process in Cesura is more like you enter like a, an internship, or assistant, and within inside you carry, you try to carry the agency um, from the inside slowly to become a, a photographer, or you maybe you are already a photographer, but you start from from nothing, and then and from the practice inside the studio. It's, so we go back really to the local, the physicality of being the nature, the physicality of being in, in this remote village uh, starts from there more than the quality of the photography. And within there, uh, you become a photographer, develop your own project, you follow by, by, by us, me not anymore so much. No, still, I'm still there actually, but uh, from Ariana Arcara or from, uh, I, I mean, all the, 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 the established Cesura photographer. And from there you become, you try, we try to make your voice be loud here magnum your voice has to be already loud <laughs> and if we, if within be magnum maybe you're gonna be, become louder but you have to be already loud the first day and uh, in chisura no it doesn't matter S slowly uh, raise we try to raise you um to be yeah. independent independent this is, uh, this is the similarity between magnum and chisura both have to be independent try to be detached from as much possible. Uh, of course, we have a compromise and, uh, and a house to be paid, uh, rent to be paid. So we have to compromise some time, but uh, uh, to be as much independent possible from uh, from the system, the market, I don't know how what, yeah. how to call it, but your work is the same, Aaron, uh, you try to do the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. I mean, that, that point of independence, maybe this is a question to just throw out to, to all of you or, you know, whoever wants to answer. Um, but, you know, there's that question around independence and how necessary that is for, to, to kind of, to be able to make the work. Um, but do you, do, do, do you as a collective um, whole, do you see being a photographer, you know, and this is just the reality of it, is being a photographer a sustainable source of income? And, you know, in your roles, the, the organizations that you're with, are you expecting photographers to kind of be able, you know, and be available at the drop of a hat? Or do you, um, or do you expect them to also have found alternative ways to support themselves alongside doing kind of commissioned work? Um, you know, and, and, and I guess the second, the second side of that is, in order to get on your radar or to to find you know to 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 be for you to be aware of them um do you feel like there's um a requirement for photographers to invest financially and you know time wise as well but hev heavily in their own work through self you know self promotion self publishing photo books entering competitions that have fees attached to them you know um getting exposure in publications that might not pay um to publish work, um, you know, or or are there are there ways to disrupt that? Are there ways 
um, that photographers can can kind of yeah engage with with you and with the media at large um, without having to be either um, supported by others or you know independently wealthy. <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> I mean, I think you know that. I always say to everybody, so if you open a pizzeria, it's much better than uh, than uh, open a company of photography. Seriously, you make it's simple, it's a business, etc. In photography, you know really well. Every day, you have to be creative in uh, how to fund the money how to pay, I mean, it's a really almost, uh, it's a challenge, at, uh, it's unbelievable, this challenge, you know very well what I'm talking about. Um, it's not even that, there are, that these things, there are not money there anymore, it's more like, it's really, it's like, the, you need to eat everyday bread, you don't necessarily <laughs> need to see picture every day, so it's like opening a, 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 a travel agency in 2022, you have to really be humble and find uh, uh, a way to put together creatively ideas, not only pitching a story for the magazine, because uh, we, we, I mean, sometimes it's, it's fantastic, but there is not enough magazine for everybody. There is not en enough fund for everybody. And there are more and more photographer, more and more great photographer. Uh, you have to be creative. You have to be creative and uh, find a smart solution to survive. If you use the, if there is a brand to use, uh, use it. Uh, but uh, uh, but beside that, uh, humble and creativity. That is the only things I will come come out to say. I mean, Magnum is a huge company, uh, but at the end, is always uh, is struggling for money. Chizura is a small company really the revenue is ridiculous but it's never lose money so <laughs> but freedom and uh, and and uh, it's, it's uh, as a cost you know <laughs> yeah anybody else any of the commissioners i'm just curious what your kind of um understanding of of you know the sustainability of a photographic career what where do you what's your role in that and how and how would you encourage people to be able to continue to make work um and be photographers in the long term, as well as in the kind of short term? Um, well, great, we might get dark quickly here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I what I tell photographers when I meet them uh, is, you know, and we really are trying to get to know one another and um, I have a pretty wide range of, sorry, that's my dog, um, <laughs> I'm at home. Um, but a pretty, you know, wide range of conversation is, you know, do you have something that pays the bills right now? And um, can you keep doing it in some way and continue to do photography? Because until your photography business pays you more than whatever it is you're doing now, you might want to hold on to that. Um, I know a lot of us might just be interested in quitting our job, walking out with a camera and, you know, coming back six months later with like an amazing project, but, uh, costs can add up really quickly and um you know for folks who aren't independently wealthy i think it, it it is a struggle um the other thing i would say is i you know i focus a lot on keeping things as local as possible i'm i'm lucky at a, i work at a place where we can send somebody around the world to go do a story or um you know work with people who have access but i think for photographers you know make yourself known by really investing in your network, the people you have access to, the stories you have access to, spend that time making pictures, uh, meeting people, uh, thinking about the story and not waiting in the security line at an airport. Great. Emma, Laura, any, any ideas? Yeah, I was just just saying on the back on the back of that, as David was saying about the local, um, there has been a major shift um, amongst NGOs in terms of who we are commissioning. And if you are based in or regularly working in any of the twenty eight countries that water trade work, yes, we want to know about it. Like it is difficult for us to follow. You know, in some countries, it can be difficult to find um, photographers. Um, Malawi, Zambia. 
Madagascar. There are great photographers there, but um, yeah, really welcome people based in those countries. It's much easier uh, for us to kind of uh, commission people based in those countries on some of those smaller commissions. And, and sometimes smaller commissions lead to bigger commissions. Um, we did something small with um, Etinosa Yvonne uh, in Northern Nigeria. We wanted her to cover um, climate. What she produced was fantastic. Um, and she's about to lead on our winter appeal shoot in Mozambique. Um, so I think, um, yeah, just to say that we, we're definitely interested in that um, geographic spread. Um, and small things can definitely lead to bigger things. Great. Uh, I, I teach at LCC um, at University in London, and we call we call um, we call what David was describing the side hustle. You know, <laughs> it's something that you you know until you and and realistically, I mean, absolutely, in answer to your earlier question, I would never expect a photographer to kind of work you know work around us we we completely understand and 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 fully recognize the challenges that face young and established um artists and photographers making money you know for making money so um you know and obviously an assignment for for a publication is one revenue stream but it's not that it's not it's unlikely to be sustainable so i mean yeah it, the i mean what i what i've what I see in the industry is, is artists who are working on multiple platforms and channels and collaborations and, and, collect, and working in, in, in collectives so that they can keep their costs down. So everything is kind of, you know, helping to kind of facilitate, you know, a shared, you know, these shared spaces. And, and so you're, you're kind of sharing the costs around so that you're not, you know, doing everything because photography, it's it, you know you work as an independent you work alone a lot of the time and it's and it's and it's really expensive mm. you know a lot of artists working on film we work with a lot of artists who are working on film film costs I mean now are just astronomical so all of those things kind of we have to be aware of those things and we need to kind of have you know have an understanding of that and and the you know the challenges that are facing the industry yeah everyone working within it great um i'm aware that time is is you know uh, of the essence so um um i'm gonna i'm gonna ask a few more questions that, but i would encourage um you know people that are watching please feel free to to start putting in questions into the chat box if you'd like um and we can pull some of those out and, and talk those through um but um before doing that, I mean, David mentioned earlier that notion of kind of gatekeeping and gatekeepers, and in a sense, all of you represent, in one way or another, the keeper of a gate. Um, and um, I was just curious if if there are ways that you see people successfully kind of disrupting that power structure or dynamic, um, or if there are alternative ways that um, you see creatives and photographers, um, yeah, kind of finding new ways to kind of reach an audience, finding new ways to um, uh, engage with media and, and, you know, the media itself is kind of changing quite rapidly as well. So, yeah, I was just curious, um, first of all, how comfortable are you being called a gatekeeper? And, <laughs> and secondly, um, how, do, how do people circumvent you um, and kind of get, get their work and their, you know, their, their practice out there? Um, and, you know, if you have any examples of people that are successfully doing that or, or platforms or ways in which people are able to do that, um, it would be great to hear about it. <laughs> uh, <huh>. Well, <laughs> I mean, I actually want to start with something that, I mean, I'd love to hear what the other gatekeepers, uh, my friends here on the panel think, but um, <laughs> something I've noticed recently is, um, is, and maybe it's always happened, but it's just, I know, you know, happening now is uh, I'll get an email that may have, you know, multiple people, on, a pitch that might have a lot of people on it, or I might just hear from colleagues that, you know, this is a, a pitch that they also got. Um, and I think I just want to um, sort of say that I think a photographer needs to be very conscious about, you know, what it means when they pitch a story. Um, because I do think that 
a lot of this is about relationships and you know work trying to find the editor or editors you work with who you sync up with who will be your advocate who will help out but i think um you know if your story is not an emergency like if this doesn't publish tomorrow um that you know bad things will happen kind of thing uh or the story will never be seen like um try and be intentional you know a lot of times at, at nat geo we have the history and culture desk i'm on we have the animals desk we have travel science and the environment um you know all very much nat geo sort of focuses foci and that um and so you know it's okay to ask somebody who you're working with like i have this pitch idea i don't know if it's right for you is there somebody else you know at your organization who this might be a better fit with you know just because you know my friend brent lewis is at uh you know new york times he may work on one desk and he might want to share it with somebody else or you know um any of those kinds of community i think what you're trying to have is con get a conversation um going so i know we want to talk about circumventing but i think that you know just blasting out to your address book um on something that you care about and are passionate about and want to work on uh is not the way I'd say to circumvent. Right. But I do think it's important what you're saying about, I mean, you know, what you're saying is very, it's, I completely agree. That point that you made about reaching out and asking questions, I think is a really important one. You know, I don't think, I think certainly there's, I feel like more questions need to be asked more transparency and more kind of honest dialogue you know I don't know the I don't know the answer to this I don't know how to do this you know I, you know because I think everybody's sort of sitting in their places I'm doing it you're I mean we're all guilty of it to a point of thinking everybody else knows how to do something and that you don't know and being afraid to ask that question and I just I I you know, I, t I think about it all the time about sort of how much, how much, um, how much, you know, people are just afraid to ask. And, and I would really encourage everybody to just ask more questions and really, you know, about everything, about fees, about conditions, about all of the, you know, involved in shooting and it, it involved more broadly, you know, about how to kind of sell your work, how to do all of these things, you know, there are, if we we need to kind of foster a new way of kind of communicating more openly, it's happening. I can see it, but it's still still a lot more work to be done in that area. I feel. Great. Not I'd like to chime in with one other thing too, because a hundred percent what Emma is saying. Um, just one other thought I had is uh, is that I think photographers need to invest in their community and not be the you know the lone ranger out there essentially. Um, you know, as a photographer, you see the world different than anybody else does. However, you're not alone. You don't bring back the story alone. You have sources, you have photographers who've inspired you, you have photo editors who support you, you have photo editors who need to reply to your emails. Sure, all of those things, but like build your community too. If an editor's not replying, do you have uh, photographers who you trust who you know, you can say, hey, can I have, can we have 20 minutes just to kind of go through this edit or go over this pitch, um, you know, or, hey, does anybody know I'm going to be in, I don't know, uh, St. Louis next week. Does anybody, is anybody there? Um, we are like, that's the other part of this family, I think, is, uh, you know, finding out um, who you can rely on, who you know, you never know where people will pop up again, um, but you still you have to invest in the community to um, to get that support. I think. Yeah. Can Can I address the question of the gatekeepers? Yes. Because I actually I think it's really important that we do acknowledge ourselves as gatekeepers, and I think especially maybe it's somewhere like WaterAid, where you know we use images of people of color because that's where we're working. Um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, to raise money. So we need to be really open about the, you know, who holds the power within the organization? How is that changing? What are we doing to change it? Uh, what conversations are we having? 
Um, so I think I kind of do acknowledge my position as a gatekeeper. Um, and I was just thinking that question about the disruptors. Um, and, and I don't think you could just kind of disrupt and go off and do your own thing and, and still have the out, this sort of, if you want to be commissioned by an NGO, at least still get that outcome because you kind of have to come through us. But um, I was thinking about um, Ida, Ida Maluna and Polly Mi Basu. And okay, this is like, they're slightly different because they're at established places in their career. That, um, but, you know, uh, neither of them uh, on the most recent commissions, we've we've had a long relationship with Polymy, but were willing, um, or it's not, it's not that they weren't willing, we didn't ask them to, but they wouldn't have used people um, in their photography. For Ida, that's because there's, a, you know, the background of um, photography in Ethiopia in the context of an NGO. So for her, this was, you know, it would have never come um, so uh, into the question. And uh, for Polymy, similarly, uh, she was moving away from documentary. And so either, you know, we went with her and we disrupted with her or, or, or that commission possibly wouldn't have happened. Um, so I think um, having, having uh, again, if you're established, having those boundaries and being really clear about them, and then seeing who's on the same page mm. and working with them and possibly together being disruptive. Great, yeah. Okay, I just wanna ask, um, before we move to the kind of audience questions, I just wanted to ask Alex as well, if there's any, if you've had seen any examples, maybe amongst recent years, Magnum nominees or otherwise, where, like you said, you know, you need to be loud to get into Magnum. Are there ways of being loud um, or ways that you've seen kind of up and coming or emerging photographers kind of, present themselves that are non-traditional and maybe a little bit more avant-garde or, you know, um, yeah, un more unpredictable that have been really successful? Well, uh, yeah, there are, I mean, there are, every, yeah, I mean, think about the, the photographer, they're probably gonna become a member tomorrow, as a, like Christina De Middel, uh, Lindo, Linduque, um, uh, Gregory Arpen, um and then uh, i don't know the others ah rafael milak now just go by memory but tomorrow probably they be will become a member of magnum so it's really another generation and uh, and there are also photojournalists uh, applying uh, there is any variety name it um uh, what, what exactly your question? Sorry, I don't want to. Well, I'm just, you know, like like going back to the idea of kind of um, finding new ways to to uh, engage with the media or the media landscape or to reach an audience that might not be going through the gatekeepers, but but you know, finding finding other avenues or ways to get their work seen and heard and and um, you know, seen by yourself and Magnum and and you know, other otherwise, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think as the um, more and more also we Magnum we create, we create collaboration with the, between us, create project. We together we 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 we. I just came from one of those we call it Live Lab in this case. Uh, you know, we were just in Switzerland. Me, Christina, Alex Webb, uh, Christina the Middle, Alex Webb, and Nusha. Um, working for two weeks on uh, on uh, on the topic of democracy, you know, it was really a collaboration with with uh, each of us were doing uh, their own things. Um, uh, but the same thing in Cesura, what, the same thing we do we do we go in a village for two weeks, uh, a group of photographers. We we work with the local photographer, with the local institution, and cre we create two work two weeks of work. We pop up a, a fast exhibition. And uh, we, in this way, we are creating um, uh, a, a Viaggio in Italia, a second, uh, this is in Italy we do that. Uh, we create a second, uh, an estemporanea, we call it, like a, a picture of Italy in 2022 through small, um, small uh, exhibition in mm. Italy with a specific time and not like, oh, the long-term project, et cetera. And, uh, and that is easy to get here few money there, few money here from a local, local council, local village. They didn't have an exhibition. We work with the kids in the school. Uh, and this is a way to survive, you know, and um, yeah. Yeah. it works really well, I have to say. And we don't have to go to a magazine necessarily to 
to ask for for money. I mean, eventually the magazine comes after to publish the, the stories. Uh, it then become a revenue after we already got you know um, the mo the money. But also another thing, we really have to cut this at the expense of our life to this, this, do this kind of job. We can't support us always unless you are a rich photographer. Mm. You can't support to live in a uh, I really, unless you do commercial photography, you have to be, you know, we, we, our studio in the, in the middle of the hill costs 5,000 euro a year. <laughs> right, uh, right. And it's big and we have printer, we make our own framings, et cetera. It would not be so possible that each of us has a small studio in, in New York, London, Milan, Paris, and then do the same work. I mean, we obviously you have to do work in fashion or do commercial work if you, unless you are rich family. Yeah. Like, of great. course. <laughs> Perfect. That's great. Um, yeah. So, so just to open up to some of these questions that are coming through, um, um, one of the questions that came through was um, how much influence does a photographer have on a commission budget nowadays? Is it always set and a take it or leave it scenario or is, is it a collaborative effort? Um, so yeah, maybe Emma, what's your situation? You said you, you kind of work with budgets and, and develop those sorts of things. Is that something that you speak to the photographer about at all or not really? Yeah, I mean, I always speak to the photographer. I mean, unless it's going through, unless we're working through an agent, um, we work directly with a lot of photographers because our our production tends to be quite kind of minimal and, and so big, you know, unless you're with an agency that takes control of the editorial commissioning it's sort of done very much directly with the artist um and I think you know we have set rates with our photographers but um we'll always have discussions on budgets you know how much is equipment you know and and we work out um how much you know perhaps if they're shooting on film or whatever you know we need to kind of factor all of those in those details into the budget so there'll be the flat right and then there'll be all of the other things on top so it's always a, a conversation um and a negotiation basically and how is the flat rate determined i mean what, on what basis are you kind of deciding what a day rate is or you know week yeah rate? i mean it's something that was set by the it's set, we have a day rate that's set by the ft and then we have a magazine day rate and um it tends to be a kind of across the board um day rate that we've that we've kind of um that we put in place a, num a, a while ago it's constantly been looked at and updated because of obviously you know the way that everything is becoming more expensive it will need to be looked at again and it's kind of across the ft then but is that i'm just curious i mean i'm not, not pressing you but is that number picked <laughs> is that number kind of picked out of uh out of thin air or you know like what is the what is the i guess rate? there's kind of an industry standard that the ft will be looking at so we'll be when for kind of for budgets for freelancers whether it's working in-house in the ft or whether it's working on assignment it will be other publications will be they'll do like a, a survey of other publications to see what the what everybody else is paying yeah. um their photographers and then that will be but also I mean we will feed into it ourselves also because we know what's happening in the industry perhaps we will we, you know fight, do some of do some of the research ourselves you know like on the weekend part of the paper because I think it's different for the newspaper to the magazine you know yeah. the the you know you if you're working on a magazine you could be working sort of long days and you know it's it's you know in labor intensive plus travel days we try we commission local but locally but you know that still can mean people traveling from one place to another and you know yeah. so all of those things have to be taken into consideration yeah david i just want to turn to you just on an editorial just you know because you're working in a similar kind of editorial sphere um how, do, how does it work in on your end in terms of um budgetary concerns and do you just do you discuss or negotiate that with the photographer in any way or not yeah, no, it's it's really uh, you have to have that a conversation about budget. Um, you know, I often I am not familiar with all locations, and you know, I don't know if there's a hotel in some of these places. So, you know, there needs to be a lot of input, and and you know, I think just the way the industry is right now, a lot of photographers are trying to think of um, you know, they kind of forget they need to eat or forget they need to 
pay for a hotel or forget, you know, some of those things. And so uh, I want to, as, you know, as a photo editor, advocate for them. And, so, you know, in order to get this story done, we need to get to this place and we need to be here for roughly this time. And, you know, photographer needs to eat, assistant needs to eat, things like that. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's it's both, you know, and I think what, and what Emma's saying is like, we all have our, our day rates, but, you know, as, since I believe there's a lot of photographers here, you know, you have to, as an independent photographer, you have to a advocate for the time needed. You're the one who knows the story, knows how long it takes to get somewhere, knows, you know, both the shortcuts, but also, um, you know, what it means to, to get something that's unique and different than, um, you know, what's already available uh, yeah. on, star you know wire photos or um uh other published stories things like that so yeah uh, ad advocate you know um as yeah, what well, you can and just ask you know is it a, you know can i stay an extra day or um you know we we have to work with uh you know it's covid so we have to work with uh, quarantine days too um mm. in some locations uh, we don't want to just rush somebody into a spot without taking the proper precautions um, yeah great I mean I'm going to press on um, I'm being encouraged to press on with questions um, but maybe Laura you can you can kind of respond to this one um, so we've got a question um, in reference to something David talked about earlier where um, editors might work with the photographer to tweak pitches and and make them a bit more robust um, and they write, as, as a Latin American, where the photography and storytelling industry is not as developed as it is in the US and Europe, um, it is very challenging to hit the right spot at the first attempt when pitching. Um, so what's a good way to approach editors in order to get them to you know, foster collaboration and perhaps kind of help tweak and polish um, an idea, pitch, that sort of thing? <laughs> I don't know if you I don't know if you can respond to that but yeah go for it yeah um, I mean maybe part of that question is also the kind of different cultures of photography and how the different languages of photography how we talk about photographs and obviously within certain parts of the world you know there's a there's a certain kind of uh, vocabulary and and culture that's that's developed around it whereas in other parts of the world you know it's 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 very it's very matter of fact and and uh, you know less com less less com complicated in the sense of being complicated not um mm. yeah but i guess i guess in a way that's what would make it interesting to me and i i don't i would don't think i would sort of sit here with the arrogance to say that i would know all mm. of those those but those different ways of representation but um it, it would make it an interesting pitch to me if that person said you know this is my approach because of xyz and 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 you know we're really thinking about like modes of representation, how we're depicting people, and so if uh, I'm I'm probably more interested in a photographer who is staying sort of really true to uh, a practice and saying I'm doing it like this because of X Y Z, um, uh, rather than sort of me sort of saying you know, can you change your practice to make it palatable to this audience. Um, because in a way, I guess, sort of my work is explaining it to, the, mm. to this audience, and this audience can learn to see it the way you're presenting it. Mm. Um, so I might change it slightly. I don't know if that's just a way. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, that's really helpful. I mean, I think part of this is also that, you know, obviously, English is certainly not everybody's first language. And so when they're pitching to you or when they're pitching, you know, to your organizations and that sort of thing, how aware are you? Obviously, in recent years, especially, there's been a real... Um, movement to kind of diversify the voices that are being put out there and have representation from all sorts of different cultures and communities. Um, but if if people don't necessarily have the language or the the kind of um, experience or, or training on how to pitch, um, um, you know, to you to you all, um, you know, it, are, is that something you're aware of and that you're willing to engage with and 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 help kind of translate um, from one you know, to the next. David? Oh, to, yeah. 
Um, I wasn't sure <laughs> what it was for. So I was like, really I'm just throwing them out there now. I'm kind of just um, hoping. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I like, listen, I would could probably speak for all editors that everyone's super busy and has lots of deadlines. Um, so to photographers who are setting out a pitch, which often is, you know, months of deliber deliberation, hours and hours of Google research, maybe uh, a university or library research or, or other things, um, it is hard to then send your pitch out and either not get um, feedback or not, um, not hear anything. Um, but, you know, I think, I guess what I would say is I, I, I think it would help for photographers to think about not just what is their story, but like, why is the person you're sharing it with care? Like, think about your audience and your audience is that editor, but that editor then has to pitch it again. And then eventually it has to go to their audience. So, you know, think about not just what it is your story that you want to do, but like a few steps, you know, down the line. Um, and I, I think also photo uh, photographers would do really well to before they pitch something, see if that publication has already done that story, see if that publication has, you know, is interested, has done something around that story. What could you bring that's new or different? Mm. Um, I mean, the essentials of, of a pitch is, it's, it's like five things, but I think everybody, you know, something you have to practice over and over again. It's a muscle that, you know, if you don't write those emails, you know, you're going to, you know, it's not like you just automatically get better at it as time goes on. You actually have to uh, practice and and know, mm. you know, yeah, who's on the receiving line of that. You know, what is Emma interested in? Can you like see what she works on? Can you um, see which kind of photographers she works with? Can you, um, you know, think about, you know, stories that would interest her so that, you know, I think that would help with success. Yeah. That. Just to add, well, only just to add to to David's comments to say that you know it's not that um, you know if we've run something before, it, it's not that it, we can't be looking at it again that topic because there's so many kind of nuances and so many kind of directions for subjects to go. It's more about acknowledging that the story exists and what you are bringing to it more than what we've already produced. So I think that's. And also, it, it, you know, with, of course, looking at what we're working on and who we're working with, but knowing also that we are also trying to broaden our um, vision always. And so to kind of to know that you, it may be something we've never seen before and published before, but it's it's relevant and it's and it's well told and well researched and all of those things. And, and so there's a kind of there's there's a kind of added you know some complexity to that to kind of you know um to be aware of really yeah yeah great i've got a question here for alex um which i'm just going to th throw at you so the question is um what for you was the key moment in your career where you felt your work was acknowledged and recognized and how do you think you attained that so i guess yeah it's a question of and and you know and is that the goal you know um uh is that success to you or you know i guess yeah, but the question is when when did you first feel that you were really um, you know that you that you'd been heard in a sense? Uh, the, the word career is uh, the one uh, I is, <laughs> is really uh, complicated uh, to because yeah, it's really like Glo Saxon also the idea of career, yeah, really uh, because it's about a series of success. So for me, never work as a photographer it never was uh, an issue. The career was uh, something comes alone. Uh, to answer the question, I would say, for me, the most successful when every time I, I manage to do a book, uh, not necessarily have been sold, but every every time it's like I, I close a chapter and there is something that stays as uh, uh, the work as I intended the work to be. Mm. Uh, it doesn't have to be successful or repeat myself but that is a, always a successful point point of my my work in terms of career i know there are sometimes awards uh, sometimes you know even when i entered in magazine in 1986 uh, 
Uh, the last time I was a waiter was in 1999. So <laughs> even I was a photographer, I was carrying, carrying play to make my money and pay my... So there is not such a thing like success uh, in terms of career. But I repeat, the body of works, uh, a nice exhibition, where you feel that you can move on on your work and uh, you you put the, the dots where you have to be and you you from the mess for every photographer has a big mess in their head there are many photo many picture when you get together in a in a contain in something you can touch is uh for me that is successful self-publish yeah. uh style the mac uh, doesn't matter uh, the most important uh, is that you feel that you have something that you can see and touch. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, yeah, that's really important. I think, um, you know, I think a lot of the discussion that we've had today is also around that idea that, that photography is a passion. It is, it is a kind of a calling in a way. Um, and, and, uh, and, and quite often the people that are doing it are, are not doing it for, for a career or, you know, to, to, for, for financial or, or um, status or, you know, th those sorts of gains. And even if they were, um, that's that's quite difficult to achieve anyway. Um, but I but I do you know, but I do think it's important because of the changes that have kind of occurred, um, especially recently, and the awareness now around kind of diversification. Um, that you know that we have to be aware of the fact that not everyone has that privilege. Um, uh, I you know, totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah, and I think you know it, it, it's interesting. I think it would be interesting to think about how. Um, how you, how you how you can achieve those things without without the, having the privilege or the the kind of um, everything at your fingertips right away. Um, so yeah, I think that's yeah that's a point to maybe think on uh, in a longer sense. Um, I was thinking. Can I, I think just say that you know. Yeah, go for I it. Think, yeah. I mean, just going back to something we talked about earlier about like you know, like how do you get around all the gatekeepers and things? It's um, I mean, I think there are ways like you know, and it does happen, but I. I would just caution making that be your approach as a photographer. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, listening to Alex talk about, you know, what keeps him going and feel like he's achieved something is like so centering for me about, you know, why you do this kind of photography. Um, on, you know, sorry, it's not about the money and it's not about like, uh, or zooming to the top, it's really like, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And, you know, I think it's about, it really is a, a long-term thing um, for doing this. You know, Tyler Mitchell, whose photography all of a sudden exploded uh, because Beyonce, you know, selected him as the photographer uh, for the cover shoot. That does happen, but like, it's, really really rare so I think you know kind of what we were saying like the side hustle community building are really and you know the relationship building are the things to focus on yeah no I think that's a really good point I think just yeah being a part of the family and contributing to that and and also supporting you know supporting others in in their their pursuits as well whether that's giving people feedback or or helping them make contact with 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 the gatekeepers that you might have access to and, and otherwise I think that's that's a really important aspect of it as well um great well I'm giving I'm being given the kind of two minute warning but I think we're going to go I'm, I'm just, I've got one last question just to, to kind of wrap it up um so um I, I just wanted to you know as as we move forward I'm just curious from your perspectives um how do you imagine and I know you know none of you are fortune tellers but um how do you imagine the kind of editorial and commercial landscape, the media landscape for photography um, might evolve or change, you know, in, in the near future, in kind of the next five to 10 years? What, what kind of, you know, you're at, the, you're at the heart of it. And I'm just curious what you're sensing in terms of how, what directions it, it might be moving in um, and how, you know, and just so the audience members that are, that are in, interested in engaging can think um, into the future as, as well as into the present um, and how they might in engage with that. It's a tough question, I know. No. <laughs> can, can I answer from a very specific uh, NGO point yeah. of view? Because I wonder if, if, if you're not sort of in this sector thinking about the, it all day every day, you might just have an idea of what NGO photography is 
and and some people for some people like even those words might sort of make them like sort of go on edge mm. um because it has a history um uh, that is not entirely um positive and is is bound up in a lot of um uh, negative power dynamics but i i and but it it is changing i think it's changing s- slowly um so i would say we're not going to see you know out and out changes um we we continue to test imagery and although people generally tell us they might not like um some of that uh, more negative needs based imagery it is still the money it is still the kind of imagery that they will donate to even if they that is the same person that says they dislike it so um we need to kind of, so that sort of need based imagery will not go away with an NGO photography but we need to change how we do it and we are changing it and then when we have got the space because we're doing an exhibition or doing something in the media we will really push those boundaries and be creative and we'll use photo um we, you know we'll use collage we'll use self-portraiture we'll really like test those things so i just i think i would say in terms of NGO photography it is changing it's quite exciting um okay i mean more specifically like how, how like how are you how is it changing do you mean the kind of visual languages that you're using or the voices that you're using or you know what yeah. what 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 do you mean by that change i know that you're saying yeah, that sure. you're moving away from the kind of cliche charity images yeah. but but in what direction do you like what directions are you going okay so we're definitely moving away in terms of the kind so the, the voices and who the photographers are and i think that change brings it brings with it perhaps some of some subtle nuances sometimes um so doing that um need-based imagery but um with someone who is a attuned to what this image might look like in a context or within a history of um, NGO photography and some very sort of subtle changes in um, the way they document a person's life or we're telling a more rounded story about a person it's not just about their access to water and and not putting those cliches into the edit um, you, you know we we wouldn't have an image of a a uh, child drinking dirty water whereas we might have done uh, in the past so there are those kind of subtle changes because we're changing who's taking the, the the photographs but then and those those other changes that are kind of the bigger kind of I would have never expected an NGO to do xyz that's where we're doing um afrofuturism um eco-feminist dystopian um, self-portraiture in terms of uh, Polymy Basu's recent work for us. Um, we've got very kind of lyrical impressionistic work from Laura El Tantawi that's it's not about it, you know it's not a description of what she saw in front of her it's the the emotions that she felt or that she felt the people being photographed were giving to her and then she's transposing that so um I don't know if that did that answer your question. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's a much more expansive and and you know uh, diverse language. It you know visually and and the voices that are that are telling them. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, Emma, do you have any uh, you know what's on the horizon ideas? I think it, I think what's what I've seen is you know certainly with the F, within the FT, there's some like more employee driven initiatives. You know, and and think rather than the top down system, it's kind of you know, um, where I was having a meeting today with a colleague, and 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 she was telling me about um, and you know these initiatives that are being put through, the, for example, she works with an um she works within an um LGBTQ community at the FT called Proud, and. Uh, it's completely led by the employees rather than from the management. And I think those, those initiatives need to consider, continue within organizations in order to kind of change that kind of power dynamic that, that um, the, the negative power dynamic that it's not just, you know, in humanitarian photography, it's across the board, you know, mm. so it's sort of, it's something we all need to be aware of. And, and as David was saying before, you know, kind of, presenting over multiple chat platforms as well think sort of keeping 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 the audience in focus you know where are they where are they where are they 
seeing where are they you know where are they active and rather than it us kind of delivering to one platform and one platform only it's sort of it cannot doesn't function like that and and so much traffic is coming from from ways that were unexpected maybe a few years ago and are completely kind of normal now you know it's sort of yeah and to keep keep embracing that as and and of course within the culture the visual language is continually continually emerging and evolving and 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 you know we we're responding to that through how you know the work that we're producing in the public and you're hungry and, and i imagine you're hungry for it as well it's so you don't yeah, want to you, you don't I mean, want to see what you've seen before you want no, to see no no it. and we're all looking for kind of fresh ways of you know storytelling i mean it's all storytelling we're talking about and you know i i'm teaching and i'm working with artists you know who are coming up who are like the the next kind of the next um you know sort of um voices that are emerging and it's really fascinating to see how they're telling stories and to be responding to that and finding ways to respond to that through the publications that we're working yeah. with and uh, you know all of the side projects and the side hustles yeah that are happening David I was just curious as well because you were talking about you know how National Geographic is working with different platforms and you're kind of interested in this idea of engaging with you know social media TikTok um but you know those things are with us now. I'm just curious if you if you get a sense of a National Geographic if they're starting to move in in other fields. I don't know VR or uh, you know what else what else is kind of on the horizon that that people might want to start researching and engaging with. Um, yeah, I think uh, AR VR are great places to um, for the kinds of storytelling we do. Um, really center it around you know the audience uh, and bring that experience to um, to them. Uh, you know, and, and, but even if that's not where you're headed with like you, that level of technology, I mean, I think just bringing that storytelling is, is really important. Um, I encourage the photographers I work with to, to think of themselves, um, you know, kind of as a director in a way of the story, a visual director, um, you know, what, what are the photographs that they can bring to it? But, you know, there's curation involved, there's research involved, um, you know, on the history and culture desk, it might be really interesting to dive into an archive and then update that story 50 years later. Um, and, you know, both on the printed page, but in an incredible sort of immersive way, uh, digitally, mm -hmm. we can bring some of those uh, voices back from 50 years. We can uh, uh, modernize, you know, bring things from, from today, um, bring new voices in that weren't included from then. Um, so I think, you know, just thinking outside of the edges of photography too, with um, with audio and video, VR, 360, whatever is your your interest um, and what you think are the right tools to tell your story, um, but to be sort of more holistic about that. Yeah, great. And Alex, any um, any any predictions for the future? Any any anything you see kind of happening at Magnum or Chisura or elsewhere that? Um, you feel like is a really exciting new direction? Uh, no idea, no <laughs> okay. idea, no idea. When I start photography about 30 years ago, I never imagined to 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 be in this situation. <laughs> so I really no idea. I can just say community is uh, absolutely uh, a must more and more. We are we think uh, we are always with our Instagram, with our I don't have Instagram, our <laughs> screen. Uh, uh, my computer, my digital camera, my film, uh, and my darkroom. I think uh, we have to start to rethink uh, the model of this society. I mean, photography, ph photography society, and think about community. Yeah. But uh, not community really, or Facebook, uh, community like get together, uh, share costs uh, of uh, any operation, uh, be humble, accept, uh, not be egoistic, and not be. Uh, the, just, just to create a harmony between a group of people and then uh, I think it's, a, it's the only solution. You know, protect ourselves in the past. Now that they can come directly one by one to us, they, they is like uh, Amazon, there is all the, yeah. the usual socks, but, but we should uh, uh, protect ourselves uh, from uh, what is uh, the common sense uh, of uh, the life we live. And we live too long. I mean, Mozart is 27 years old. 
<laughs> you die <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it's too long this life. <laughs> well, maybe that's the perfect place to end on because I think this talk has gone on too long as well. So, um, <laughs> so thank you for that, and um, thank you to all the speakers. I really appreciate um, you know all of your input. Um, and there's so many. You know, obviously we're gonna we're gonna raise more questions than than provide answers. Um, but hopefully, um, you know, I, I do know that 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 it it's helped me kind of understand and, and think a lot about um, you know where things are and where things are going and um, and and how how photographers can engage with that and also be you know be a part of that that community, um, not just on a a, a kind of creative or a, a, a financial sense, but also um, you know yeah on a life sense to make it to make it to make it part of one's I, life. But, yeah. but you should you supposed to answer that question. <laughs> What's I mean, on the I mean, I mean, no, slant, I'm the moderator here. That's the, yeah, no, yeah. but slant, slant uh, was uh, was uh, again uh, putting together, you know. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, right now that I've gone red faced, I'm gonna have to. Um, <laughs> but I want to thank Amelie and uh, and Foam and everybody at Foam for um, hosting this. Um, and like Amelie said, I think there's a there's a, well there is another talk um, happening in several months' time. Maybe she could tell you a little bit about that now. Yes. Well, what an evening. Thank you all for Thanks. and all the fantastic speakers for sharing your experience, the insights you. and special shout outs to Aaron for doing a wonderful moderation. So relaxed, super interesting to to follow along. And indeed, we have a part two of this talk coming up, uh, which is scheduled for August 17. Uh, there we welcome Miriam Bolos, Bike de Porta and Rahim Fortuna. And I think we're gonna yeah, continue from the perspective of the photographer and definitely we have more to talk about when it comes to also building a community together. And there is a lot more events to join. So thank you to the audience and for being there and uh, follow us for updates on the socials and have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Great. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you.